Hi again, welcome to Hard Boiled Synthesis Lecture 8, where I just continue the mega aggravating phase in meta analysis, which is extracting data from studies. Today I'm going to try to do some quickly. I know I've said that in the past, there's always hiccups, but I feel I got a gut feeling today things are going to go nice. Um, and so I'm just going to jump into it. I mean, I think you guys get the picture of what I need to do. I need to pull out um, data in which catnip is used as a repellent against uh, mosquitoes compared to DEET or some other positive control. And that difference between the two or the comparison between the two, the contrast between the two is what what's called as an effect size, and that is the data for meta-analysis. So my goal is always to find these paired data so that I can compute an effect size. Has it been easy so far? No. Um, there's been some slight inconsistencies in experimentation. This I'm always surprised with repellent studies. There are guidelines out there, EPA, World Health Organization, yet there is huge diversity in how to approach a repellency test. Now, it seems like some of these studies were actually motivated by uh, something different than just uh, testing the efficacy of catnip. They were experimenting with different approaches to um, disseminating or releasing catnip into the environment. So we had uh, different lotions, we had fabrics, and I'm sure today we're going to see other alternative approaches to um, to exposing mosquitoes to catnip. And so without further delay, I mean, I spent an hour just talking about one study before, twice in a row. I got to get into it. Let's do it fast. And so here's my Excel sheets. I already brought up. Uh, the next study to process, study 29, I identified it as a potential candidate with um, study. I mean, the title itself is really what I want. Repellency assessment of Napata essential oils against Aedes mosquitoes. I mean, this is flat out exactly what I wanted and hoping to get through my search. And so let's just start populating uh, the Excel sheet already. We got study number 29. I mean, the mosquito species is right in the title. Another 80s. Mosquito. Now I'm just going to uh, quickly identify characteristics of the mosquito. Again, these are all important coding criteria to evaluate the quality of studies. Uh, they provide the chemical structures of nepatolactone. That's kind of cool. There's two, it looks like uh, it's an isomer. Yeah, okay, two isomers. Isomers, uh, same compound, but just like uh, variation in... Um, I mean, I'm going way back into organic chemistry here, and I'm quite my variation in how the molecular structure is formed. Um, okay, but I'm I'm my goal is to just finish this, and so let me just uh, quickly go to the methods. We got essential oil preparation, purification. Okay, so that you know the study goes a bit further, not only. Um, uses catnip oil, but goes further and tries to extract the nepatolactone chemicals, which is a fairly tedious process. Mit mosquito rearing, um, not so crucial. What I want is the part of the methods that talk about how to, uh, how they tested the repellency of uh, catnip. Repellency was determined by one choice landing assay that uses the amount of mosquito landings to calculate the overall effect is. Okay. So the response is landing, landing times, 
20 adult females were aspirated into a cage. All right, I could start filling this up. Twenty. It's a cage experiment. Doesn't look like they use humans. The different treatment was at on filter paper. Okay. So and then they. Filter paper to ensure acetone. And it looks like they warmed up the filter paper, maybe. Heat pack. Heat pack was used as a source of the attractant. Okay? So no humans as the attractant. Again, a piece of filter paper with that gets warmed up, and then on it, it has a repellent or some other control. So, uh... Infused paper in cage. I'm just gonna change the color. Pardon the noise, there's trees getting cut in the neighborhood. All right, what else do we need to code? So we got time course assays, we got results. Let me just jump, see if there's a figure that I could use. Landing reduction dose response curve. Okay, so this is uh, what we want. Landing reduction percentage. That's, um, that's not ideal. Data percentage wise, it's a you would I would rather have counts or an average count rather than a protect uh, landing reduction. Data was analyzed with uh, p tests. Okay, so letters above means uh, differences, but this seems a little weird. Like it says at the end after a one percent treatment. Um, Almost everything they tested was a 100% reducing the effect. So I got to read up more on that experiment. Uh, that just seems odd. Dose dependent curve generation. Okay, repellency was determined. Heat cage, filter paper treatment to ensure reduction. Controls showed no significant repellency and thus data were not presented okay well that's an issue because um i guess the negative controls showed no repellency effects i mean again that goes back to what i was describing in earlier lectures it's really important to choose the right type of control positive negatives negatives that show no variability in outcomes are really not useful at all and in in this case they decided to not even report the results mostly because i imagine it was just a giant list of zeros um, six repetitions were performed with 20 mosquitoes for each treatment. Okay. All right. So sample size of six. Um, complete initial tests showed few were observed generating mosquitoes. Time lapse photography recorded one image every five seconds for five minutes. Okay, that is, uh, okay, so the, re all right, so the results presented in that figure are results based on repellency effects in five minutes. I don't know if that's um, useful for what, um, it, that seems way too short. Let me keep going, see if there's more data. Okay, so there's a nice image of the uh, way they set up the experiment, which is nice, right? You got a piece of paper, warmed up piece of paper versus a non-warmed up piece of paper with repellent, without repellent, that's cool. It's always good to have a visualization of the experimental design. 
um, for clarity, for transparency. Okay, so here we got some more results, which may be more interesting. Landing reduction time course analysis. Okay, so now they actually measure things for a longer, longer amount of time, which is is better. Crude CR nine. I need to figure out what the crude CR nine is. And then I think I'll be extracting the data from this one because it makes more sense. It's an, uh, um, if I would extract data from this, the experiment seems too short again. And then there's like a cap to uh, landing reductions after five minutes. I'm not too sure why they did it this way. This is not standard um, practices in determining repellency activity just to have it such a short time frame. My feeling is that, you know, be, uh, it's because they, um, they use their extractions of the um, nepatolactone, which is, I imagine, expensive. I mean, it's a tedious thing to extract, and so you don't have much of it to begin with. Um, and so you really want to do like a, a, um, a simple experiment. And, a, you know, look at the concentrations. They're just so small to begin with. Yeah, I admit. Okay, so this, this, even though it's a result, I'm going to not include it because it's not really... Um, exposing mosquitoes uh, long enough to generate variation and repellency effects. The conclusion here is that um, you know all the chemicals repel it doesn't look like there's much variability and they report the numbers again this is another study where there's like a, there's a doubling up on the amount of information getting reported. So you have the landing outcomes reported in a finger, but you also have a textual description of those landing outcomes in a text. I mean, that's great for me because I could just pull out the numbers. Um, but the editor in me would be like, this is redundant. Pick one. Don't do both. I mean, you, you could have potentially cut out those plots. Anyway, whatevs. All right, so I'm just going to uh, pull out those data from figure... Figure 5, there's data availab availability... The data set generator is available if I contact. I don't think it's necessary for me to do that. The data aren't totally ideal because they're represented in a percentage. Um, but assuming that these are averages and that um, they are. Okay, so it says it right here. Values presented are means and standard deviations. I can compute an effect from that. Um, but um, as far as I know, uh, percentages uh, is not a um, percentages are bounded. It's bounded data, and so if you're approaching zero or approaching one hundred percent, then the uh, you don't expect a normal distribution in these things, and so the uh, average gets a little weird. Not ideal type of data to compute an effect with. Okay, so we have all these things at um, different time stages. I'm just going to record all of these at the different time stages. Chances are I probably will not use these all to compute effects, um, but given that it's fairly straightforward, I, I'm just going to record all of them, and then later on when I start my analyses, I might just uh, do something else with some of these data. And given that the first plot was reported in text, yeah, okay. 
then I imagine the second plot is also reported in text, and then it'll be quick for me to in plug in these numbers. Okay, so let's finish off this table. Um, did not... Okay, so we have a positive control. It was DEET, 10%. Uh, what do they call it? Percent landing. Percent landing reduction. So this is weird. Okay, so we have some studies that report the number of landings and then some that report the opposite of that, which is the number of non-landings and so I'm going to have to be an inverse the effect for these studies later on so these are represented in percentages not ideal and then I have to add a new column to outline um, the time series stuff and so I'm just going to insert be fully descriptive in what I mean so that I know what's going on. So that means I probably have to go back with the old studies and figure out what, how long they did their experiments for. But here um, we have zero, one hour, two hours, four, eight, 24. That's a bummer. That's a bummer because it's a nonlinear time series, right? So you can't really do like an ARMA model or something like that to um, adjust the, the autocorrelation between measurements um, because it's nonlinear, right? So we have like sequentially one hours, but then it doubles and then it go, jumps to 24, which is totally not part of a sequence. Okay, so 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 24. I'm just going to add an H to all that. So that later on I could standardize the units. Let's put in those numbers. So I want the response mean, which is the um, essential oil they call CR19, which is a catnip oil. Control. All right, so let's uh, zoom into the text that describes all these results. One hour, two hours, okay, start with DEET. I mean, this is nice because it's super easy for me to just plug in. All right, 99.8, 99.9. Ninety four point one, ninety seven point five, and then we have point three, one, zero point three, one, seven, two point three four. Is this standard deviations or standard errors? Standard deviations, nice. And then finally, let's do the same thing with 
the catnip, which is 99.7, So, So it looks like there's like a clear drop in efficacy after a long period of time in the catnip. 1, 3.2, and 18. There's also a huge rise in variability, again, because that's the problem with using the percentages. It's the variability gets truncated. Right? There's a cap. Don't use percentages. Landing reductions, all this stuff is the same. Three, four, five, six. Oh yeah, I still gotta figure out the ages of all these uh, mosquitoes. That should be pretty quick. This essay was performed a dose response curve, DEET, mosquito filter paper, mosquito rearing, were placed in a container, will hatch. All mosquitoes began in pupa. They were separated from a small container. This container was then placed in a rearing cage, allowed to mature to adults. Mature females were visually identified, then separated by the population. Cage where they were given 10%. Mature females were kept in these conditions until experimentation. Okay, did not describe the age. Since they were performed, were evaluating oils during a 24 hour period. Six, that's the replications, similar to the dose response method. Okay, so six, sample size of six. Again, I, that is a fairly low sample size. And then they say that the methods are the same from... The other thing, okay, 20 females were aspirated in the cage and starved for one day. Nice. Starved. They say adult. Um, I mean, by definition, a pupated insect is an adult. So this does not provide information on how old the mosquitoes are. Penalty was determined one chase uses the amount calculate overall effect is. 20 adult females were aspirated in a cage star for one day. Testing was performed. And I'm just double reading this to make sure that they... All right, so we don't know how old those mosquitoes are. They just call them adults. Now let's plug in some info about the catnip and then we're done with this study. Clonal population serving as a source for material for essential oils. Okay, so it's nice to actually have um, a species and a variety. And I think for the results in which we extract the data, they call it CR9. Yeah. I mean, that's cool. So I'll just, I'm just going to write all of that info down.
Napata. It's not letting me copy and paste. And it's an essential oil that they derived on their own. And they call it 10%. Experimental temperature not reported. And humidity not reported. Mosquitoes, let's just verify I got everything down. Nice, that's it. Another study done. Okay, that one was straightforward. Not ideal again, because again, they're expressing things in percentages. Um, a few gaps in experimental information that allows me to properly assess the quality of the study. But nonetheless, I'm going to move on to the next one. And uh, hopefully the next one was going to be uh, easier. So this next study is number 49. I'm bringing up here. Another scientific report one that seems like a popular place to uh, publish. Catnip stuff, I mean, it's good because it's open access. All right, all right. So study 49. Sustainable factor of insect repellents derived. Okay, so I had identified this study as uh, one that reported repellency activities, um, but it's clearly not focused on that. It's mostly focused on trying to uh, learn ways to, to derive the compounds from catnip. So I'm just going to quickly scroll, scroll to see if there's a plot or figure reporting data. It's usually the quickest way to figure out essential oil extraction, essential oil stability study. Then look at that beautiful, this is nice. Mounds of coffee husks generated by hulling factory. Okay, so this they are really just going full into it, into uh, trying to figure out how to process the chemical. Uh, okay, so no results. We got a table here. Okay, table two talks about reported side effects of lotion effectiveness to the survey. Sneezing, nausea, vomiting. Okay, that's what's kind of weird. Um, and then lotion effect. Ineffective lotion reduces bites, no bites after application. I mean, uh, what kind of response outcome is this? This is not a manipulative experiment. They are reporting some sort of, um, they're reporting results of a survey of people applying a lotion. I'm assuming the lotion is with, infused with catnip. One person said it was ineffective. Four said it reduces bites. And then 55 out of the 60 said they get no bites after application, but there's no information on a 
you know how long this uh, this is not data I can make use of there's no based solely on the lack of a control um, that's a bummer so this is totally a full-on study that gets dropped a report summit like I'm gonna re still read the paper when once I still pull together the manuscript I think there's cool information but this this type of uh, effectiveness repellency effectiveness effectiveness um, outcome is not not useful for the meta-analysis all right let's jump to the I might as well just jump to the next one I mean that was a quick one all right so this next one was study 73 let me update I processed five studies currently doing number 73 maybe this one's gonna be a fast one too chemical compositions of four Napata species hybrids against 80s Egypti um, I mean this is this is again exactly what I wanted what I was searching for this is great so let's just kind of go through it it's using different species of Napata it's nice to have that variability and hybrids that's cool that they hybridize um, and so let's just scan this quickly to find some results how do they do it uh, essential oils hydro distillation so they extracted the essential oils uh, by themselves 80s Egypti mosquitoes we got lots of information on on the age of mosquitoes oh I could just start filling this stuff in that's nice okay so 49 I get to I delete it because they had no data we get 80s Egypti again Mosquito age, eight to 18 day old. I'm gonna put the range here, but a range is not useful if I'm gonna use that as a moderator variable. We're used for larval bioassays. Doesn't quite say if they were, for larval bioassays, eggs were hatched and larvae will maintain a temperature mosquito biting ass assays. Experiments were conducted using a six celled in vitro module bioassay for evaluating biting deterrent properties. Okay. Briefly, the assay system consists of six well reservoirs with each three by four wells containing blood. Feeding solution consisting of they're using artificial attractant as a feeding solution using um, who knows what this is CPDA and ATP I imagine just like chemicals trying to simulate blood and then green fluorescent tracer dye was used to determine feeding. This is a fairly elaborate design to assess repellency effects. I mean, I don't know how to code this. Uh, so they just have these little cells inside it has blood, artificial blood, and then you um, essential oils from um, the plant were tested in the study samples were applied in concentrations of 10 to 100 um, and then compared to DEET it provide the actual uh, nanomolecules nanomoles of DEET don't provide the nanomoles for the compound that would require some conversions temperature of the solution reservoir maintained at a high temperature Again, trying to simulate blood. There's a Teflon separator between treated cloth and the modules. 
The number of mosquitoes biting through each cloud were recorded for three minutes. So they're looking, so, it's, so this is not um, landing rate data, this is like feeding. Number of feeding attempts. Two sets of five replication each with five females per treatment conducted on two different days. Treatments were replicated. Okay, so this is a... I really dislike this type of description of samples, right? You're here, the, instead of just saying the number per sample, you have to do the math in your own head to figure out what the number of replicants were. Two sets of five replications with five females per treatment were conducted two different days, and then the treatments were replicated 10 times. I mean, I don't know what the sample size is, the actual mean value at the end of the experiment. Statistical analyses, proportion not biting, proportion not biting was calculated. Okay, so I, I'll just start populating the spreadsheet now. We have four different types of Napata. Uh, I don't know what, it's like a bio assay, bio assay, where, where individuals are tested. So other, the other experiments, we had like a box filled with mosquitoes, we're looking at landing rates. Here, individual mosquitoes are tested. Um, so I'm just going to call it individual bioassays. Temperature. Yes, they do talk about temperature of those cells, although it doesn't... Temperature of the solution in the reservoirs was maintained at 37 degrees. But it doesn't really say what temperature the mosquito is exposed to. But if it's like in a little cell compartment, I can't imagine the temperature being too different. Nonetheless, I'm going to have to put not reported. One individual. Yeah, okay. So number of mosquitoes in the experiment, one. But that doesn't mean that's, um, that's a bad thing. It's just a type of experimental design. So again, I process, this is the fifth study, a totally different experimental design for each one of those five studies. So much for EPA and world health consistency and testing repellency responses. Okay, okay, five one-day-olds. Okay, I'm reading the larval bioassay stuff, not useful. Six celled in vitro wells containing artificial blood. So the attractant individual bioassays with simulated blood. So no humans involved in the experiment. Feeding is the response. Samples were applied at concentrations of 10 and 100. Hopefully there's just a figure that just outlines that somewhere. DEET was used as a positive control. I love it. DEET at Ugh, totally different um, measure here. I'm just going to copy and paste that. So they didn't report it in percentages. They reported it as in moles, which means I'll have to convert that into a percentage at some point. I still don't know what the actual value of the response is, if it's an average or just a count. Samples 
age of mosquitoes, age of mosquitoes. Three minute exposure. All right, zipping through this. Dye. Samples were applied in concentrations. Reservoirs covered in layers. Mosquitoes were squashed, and the presence of a dye was used as an indicator of feeding. All right. Destructive sampling. A replicate consisted of six treatments, four test materials. DEET, which was a positive control, and an ethanol-treated organdy as solvent. Ethanol-treated organdy as solvent. Solvent control, so they did have a negative control. I'll code that in there, too. I'm not too sure what they mean. It's just ethanol. So solvent negative control. Unknown concentration. I'm gonna it's gonna suck to try to figure out what the re actual replication of it. Maybe they provide stats and I could just get to it right away. All right, let's figure out what um, figure out what the results are. So they derive a bunch of compounds. I like it when they do this kind of stuff. It's very, um, you know, you're trying to tease out the causative agent of the repellency effects, and so you uh, use different chemicals within the plant to figure it out. Water distilled essential oils. Ma 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 ma. Figure, figure, figure. Table, 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 figure, table, figure. Biting deterrence index of essential oils extracted from samples of aerial parts of these four species. Against female Aedes aegypti, ethanol was used as a con. DEET was used as positive control. But... Um, there's only one column only one bar for each response. This is confusing because if there should be like a bar for like the bar for the essential oil, a bar with DEET and a bar with the uh, negative control, the just uh, a solvent. Um, but we just have the one bar here. BD. I gotta look up what B BDI is. I think I'm familiar with a BDI. And you know, quickly scanning through this, I saw that there was a big equation. It looks like it's like a type of metric. It gets used to quantify repellency outcomes. If it is, that's not good. BDIs were calculated with the following formula. Ugh. Bunch of um, P and B denotes proportion of females. Okay, so we got proportions, P proportions used within an equation. Proportions not biting when exposed to test compound. PNBB denotes proportion of females not biting the solvent control. PNBBD denotes proportion of DEET minus the control. Okay, let me wrap my head around this. So we have catnip minus solvent control divided by DEET minus solvent control. Whew. That is that is way too much. This is I how would you ever estimate the error from this? The standard deviation. It's just like it's a weird, super weird metric. You got a ratio of proportions. You could take the difference between a proportion and do a test, statistical test on that. That could be converted into a Z, a Z score. But then you, if you take the 
if you divide it by another difference in proportions, then that gets a super ugly. And just eyeballing it here, there's absolutely no way for me to backtrack and try to get the values, the numerical, the counts that were used in the proportions. And there's no... So this would fall under like metric, okay? I am so far away from the bedrock, which is the counts here, um, that I'll need some time to figure out what to do here. Because I feel like there's nothing I could do with this. Because it's just, it's an index, right? It's not a full-on response. It's a collection of responses summarized already. So what they're trying to do here is do it. They figure out their own effect size. This is what they're trying to do. Estimate an effect size of the outcome of the experiment and, and controlling for all of these different positive and negative uh, controls relative to catnip. I, my impression is that's not what's really happening here. There's too much going on into the estimation of the metric. I guess I could go into reading what the derivation of the metric is. I'm assuming that's what's reported here in study 15. I'll have to go back to that one. Um, DBI value of zero indicates an effect is similar to ethanol, while a value significantly greater than zero indicates a biting deterrent relative to ethanol. BD value is not significant. Okay, so look, no, this is not good because you have multiple nulls occurring within the metric. You have the null associated with the negative control. You have the null associated with the positive control. I feel like you could just go about this, avoid this altogether by just keeping those means separate. You know, they're just count data in the end, feeding or not feeding. You could just do plug it in as an, as an odds ratio or something like that. To determine whether confidence intervals include the values of zero one, Sheffe's multiple comparison width that was used. I don't understand that. Biting deterrent activity was compared among treatments based on non-overlapping confidence, confidence intervals. This is also, no, no, you can't do that. You can't compare two confidence intervals and make a good assessment on whether or not they differ or not. If two confidence intervals don't overlap, okay, maybe you have some confidence that they differ at a, uh, oh man, at a 0.05 alpha significance value. But if they overlap, that 0.05 alpha is not that anymore. It's not 0.05, it's some other thing. Um, and so you may conclude that there's no difference between the two because the confidence intervals over up, but you're actually doing a weird test there and there may be a difference, but you're not assessing it at the standard 0.05 alpha level. And so you would need to adjust the confidence intervals to be able to do that test or alternatively, rather than do the overlap, you calculate the confidence intervals of the difference between the two values. Anyway, that seems too complicated. <sighs> this is an, I feel like this is another bummer study because it's uh, one, it's using the metric, which is not, it's an effect size already and it makes it difficult to get an assessment of the difference between the two. Um, there's no way for me to make an assessment on whether or not the difference in effect can be back calculated into an effect size that I need for meta-analysis. And so my gut feeling about this study, even though it's reporting cool results, I am unable to retrieve an effect because of this uh, metric. The metric already accounts for the difference between um, the control and the treatment outcome.
and it's not expressed in a way in which I could backtrack the calculation. A lot of effect sizes and meta-analysis have their statistical foundation grounded in statistics. This metric here is not, you know, trying to express a t-test differently or a z-score differently. It's just doing a bunch of um, loop-de-loops acrobatics with numbers to try to express this value. I mean, this is a mega bummer. I'll try to investigate later whether or not I could backtrack the calculations. You know, the repellency literature is filled with a lot of these um, summaries of um, effectiveness, which are essentially a type of effect size. But the effect sizes aren't really, um, they're not, they're not trying to convert the raw data into a statistic. It's just a conversion into a, typically a percentage value. In this case, it's not even a percentage value. It, it's like a, a super weird bounded where there's like zeros and then it could potentially be anything above one with multiple nulls. <sighs> okay, so I would drop this study. This is, this is what I would call a study. Um, there's like gray literature out there where you, um, you know, there's outcomes that have not been published. They're difficult to find. There may be reasons why they haven't been published, uh, but nonetheless, they do have information useful to do a meta-analysis. This I like to call a gray, gray water literature where it's published but the outcomes are just not retrievable. They're expressed in a way in which you don't have access to the raw information you need to compute an effect for meta-analysis. Okay, well, all right, that's a bummer. Um, I'll try this again tomorrow, so thanks for, uh, thanks for <laughs> watching. <laughs> I just, I wish I had a more positive feeling about these studies so far, but it's not been straightforward. Okay, so I'm going to save. I got to delete all this stuff because it wasn't included. In, I can't include it in the meta-analysis. I'll, I'll still report it in the manuscript. It'll get dumped under um, gray literature. I really call it my gray water literature. Um, as a study where the effect is irretrievable. I mean, if I wanted to, I could contact the authors, but I... Uh, I gotta move on to pro processing other studies. All right, Thursday, Friday's coming. I'm gonna get a nice break. Um, all right, take it easy.